Um, and we have a new set of panelists here. Uh, I will uh, introduce you all, starting with Hanna. Uh, Hanna Rommelhoff is from Norway, and she works for Jurk. Uh, <laughs> is it the right pronunciation? Yes. Okay. And Jurk is an um, um, uh, organization that gives legal advice uh, free of charge to women, and it's uh, I think women who give it also, like women to women uh, legal or people who define themselves as women. Uh, actually, now we're open to men employees as well. So okay. It's, uh, <laughs> but so far we're only female. <laughs> um, All right. Yeah. <laughs> Workers. Um, and um, you have been giving uh, legal advice to more than 50,000 women all over the years. And uh, I had the chance to visit Jurk actually a couple of years ago. And, and what I really liked was the systematic way of um, sort of uh, educating uh, legal students or law students uh, on women's rights issues because they had to deal a lot with women's rights issues when working with the clients and had a lot of family law and uh, I remember divorce issues issues regarding ch children and child custody, etc. So um, uh, it was a very sort of systematic approach uh, to increasing uh, capacity of law students. Um, then we have Mariam, uh, who is from Finland and a uh, well-known feminist. Uh, uh, this is what an average Finn looks like nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's the new dress code. Yeah, and she's one of the founders of a new feminist party in Finland. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, she has an impressive uh, CV. I saw from you have worked as a baker, <laughs> as a <laughs> multicultural expert, um, as a journalist, and you have a background as a refugee, I read, uh, coming from Somalia and uh, coming to Finland uh, at seven. And Helen uh, is uh, from Estonia, uh, works for Praxis, uh, pol a policy uh, research uh, center in, uh, in, based in Tallinn, mm -hmm. um, mainly with gender equality analysis. And she has uh, participated in many research projects in Estonia and in other countries. And she's currently doing a doctoral thesis. OK, so let's start talking. <laughs> Uh, the topic for uh, this discussion is um, uh, laws that uh, restrict or laws that protect. We have only one lawyer in the panel, <laughs> and that is Hanna. So you will have to stand for all the, the legal um, uh, expertise. Um, but I would like you all to start, uh, as maybe this uh, topic is a bit abstract, um, uh, to give uh, specific examples of laws, um, and maybe start with you, Hannah. You look ready. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a big responsibility to be the only lawyer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as you said, this is a very uh, interesting, but also a very abstract question. So, um, um, and uh, as my field of expertise is more based on the Norwegian law. I'll give some examples from Norwegian law, and then I have one example from India that I find to, to show very well the paradox between uh, laws that are protecting women by restricting them. So, um, uh, and as a jurist, uh, I find it hard to, to make a clear cut between laws that are protecting or restricting women. Often, um, in my experience, laws and regulations are both depending on the angle that you see it from, uh, so you can have either uh, uh, laws aiming at uh, protecting women or other values in the society, uh, but at the same time they uh, entails restriction on, on the women. Uh, and uh, some of the examples uh, uh, that I picked out in this context was um, uh, the parental leave uh, reserved for the father. Uh, in Norway, we have a parental leave period uh, that, are reserved for father, that is reserved for the fathers um, in uh, 10 weeks, or it's, uh, it's the amount of 10 weeks. And uh, this law is aimed actually at uh, creating a more, uh, or uh, 
avoiding discrimination of women in the job market because uh, there's a lot of prejudice towards women um, it's also linked to, to what Alexandra talked about, the mother penalty in a way, that uh, the, um, you think that women take m more responsibility of children and the work at home uh, and that, uh, for instance, when you're pregnant and you're going to go out in parental leave, you'll be away from work and you won't be able to uh, participate uh, participate in the same same one same way way that men do, um, and so this measure to force uh, fathers to take more part uh, of the care of children is actually thought to be um, uh, protecting women in a way. But at the same time, it's a restriction because the women are not able to to take this period themselves anymore, um, so it's kind of restricting them in that way. Uh, and then I thought uh, I'd talk about an example from our work at Jürk. We work with uh, women uh, by, um, victim of violence, of domestic violence. And in Norway we have uh, several measures to protect these women from, uh, from, uh, from the perpetrators. For instance, um, you have restraining orders or uh, 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 violence alarm. Uh, but all these, or several of these measures, they uh, actually end up restricting the women because they are living, for instance, on hidden addresses. Uh, they are in constant fear of the perpetrator, uh, perpetrator um, arriving at their door um, because uh, the protection is maybe not good enough. <laughs> uh, so they are restricted in their private life. Um, by these laws that are aimed at protecting. And in Norway we have, uh, in 2003, um, a measure called reverse uh, um, violence alarm that actually is monitoring the perpetrator and not the woman. So this is kind of a way to, there's possibilities to not restrict women and protecting them. But it's maybe not um, that uh, known and not that used. So it's, yeah. Uh, and the last example that I'll give is the Indian one um, that I, I thought was very interesting. Uh, at an Indian school, they had this rule, uh, curfew rule for girls, um, uh, prohibiting them to go out after 10 o'clock. And of course, this rule was to protect the, the women because it was uh, seen as too dangerous for women to go out uh, late at night. And um, this, of course, is a direct discriminatory law and in Norway that would not uh, have been accepted in uh, in any ways uh, but I, I find it interesting because it's a parallel to kind of a parallel to the debate that we had in Norway recently regarding rape uh, where a lot of people go out in the media and um, kind of uh, say that women should protect, they should not go out, they should not wear a skirt, a short skirts, they should uh, take uh, preventive measures not to get raped. And uh, that's uh, obviously the wrong, uh, <laughs> um, uh, the wrong angle to, to go into this debate on. You should uh, uh, rather try and uh, find a solution to, uh, to the ones, uh, the one raping, you know, you should, uh, the, the rapists are the ones who are supposed to be uh, restricted, not the, the women getting raped. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, I'll just um, sum up by saying that uh, who the society decides to protect and restrict is often a political question, especially in Norway. Uh, because, of course, the law sets boundaries on what you can do. <laughs> but um, uh, most of our laws and regulations are uh, gender neutral, and it's uh, um, for formally it's uh, good laws and regulations, but that you see in practice that there's a still a lot to do. Uh, so, um, yeah, for instance, the parental leave uh, uh, period for father is uh, a, social, uh, a socialist uh, government that... Uh, put into place um, and um, they are of course not that restricting when it comes to make, uh, making decisions on behalf of uh, families or women. So it's uh, like the political, political part of it has to decide to what we're going to talk about later, like who decides on uh, behalf of women and so yeah, I think I'll 
end there. <laughs> um, Marian, do you want to give some examples? Um, hello. Um, well, it's always good to be in Tallinn. Um, it's one of my favorite cities, probably because I haven't been to any other uh, Estonian cities yet. So I might have other favorite cities soon to come. I apologize if I seem a little bit tired. I was singing karaoke last night for the first time in my life with some sweets and uh, there was a lot of ABBA going on. Uh, when it comes to laws restricting women, um, my expertise is not in the law. So instead of uh, addressing those issues, I would rather like uh, the perspective from where I look at the situation is from a feminist perspective and often it's black feminism that informs how I study the society and what kind of analysis I kind of end up with. And the issues that you're addressing, they sound very familiar in the Finnish context as well. But then uh, it's a question that was actually brought up already in the previous panel that who are the people who are making these decisions? Like when legislations are being passed, when uh, we have discussions regarding what laws are needed and for what spaces and for whom, then it's often men who are taking part in this uh, decision making. There are often men who are doing these studies, who are being the experts and so on. So our society looks very much like how a man thinks it should look like. And the laws that inform us often come from a very male perspective. Not all of them, but majority of them. And that is one of the problems. So if we kind of want to have an impact on that, then we need to have more women in different levels of the decision making, not just at the top level, but like every level below that. And also we need to have more women in media, like everywhere, because the conversation has to start somewhere. The opinions need to be voiced. And then you have to take them further to discuss them, to debate them, to make them into law and to pass them. And for that to happen and be possible for all the genders that exist in the society, for all the different backgrounds that are all the different realities, then all those people need to be at the table making those decisions, making those conversations and getting their voice heard. And at the moment in Finland, we are like, <laughs> I know Estonia, like, I was talking to a journalist before I came here and he told me that here in Estonia you look to Finland and you think, wow, that's multicultural society. I'm sorry, but no. <laughs> I was joking when I said this is what a Finn looks like. No. Um, we have a really long way to go when it comes to diversity, when it comes to actual equality and creating a space where each of us can actually go around the city feeling safe feeling protected, feeling at home. We have a long way to go to get there. At the moment, different spaces are, um, they're very white, uh, they're very masculine. And that means that if you as a female enter those spaces, you are othered. If you are a racialized female, you are further othered. If you are a disabled person, you are othered. If you are a member of the LGBTQ community, you are othered. So the lo logics, the norms that inform us, we need to first deal with them. We have to go from a point where we say, okay, these norms, uh, they might have had a point. At, I, don't, I can't defend the norms. I don't know why we have these norms in place. Maybe there was a time when they were needed. I don't know. But in this modern society, there is no need for the norms because they restrict each and every one of us. Some might feel that, there be, that they benefit from the norms, but as long as we have them in place, they are restricting what potentials we can use, how we can apply ourselves, and how we can create an environment where we can see, feel safe and we, where we can fulfill. Uh, our full potential as humans instead of being uh, boxed into a gender or like uh, to have laws set up to protect us instead of having laws that enable us to do different things. And uh, I think in the previous panel, uh, Eva brought up this issue that when you are speaking in public about certain issues, you get a lot of uh, threats. And that's also something that is very interesting. Like who, who are the people who are making these threats and what kind of threats are made against different people? Like I, myself personally, I don't receive threats where they, uh, any, they're often white Finnish men, this I have to say, because they identify, like they write to me, like, you know, we are <laughs> very interesting people. Anyway, they never threaten me with rape or sexual violence. Instead, what they write to me is that I should be deported or it's like things that are related to uh, my perceived religious background, my ethnic background, uh, and the continent Africa, because apparently that's a country 
where you can just dump black people <laughs> that are not happy with how things are in Finland. And because I often speak as a feminist, then that is taken as like, you know, something that, oh, here in Finland, we're all equal. Once I made the comment that according to an EU study, um, Finnish women face a lot of violence. And I said that on TV. And after that, I got a shitstorm hit me going like, oh, you think Finnish men are violent to their women. Why don't you go back to Africa? <laughs> and you're like, I didn't say that. I just commented, like I repeated what was said according to the study. And they were like, no, we're not having that. Like, you know, Finnish men are not, how, who are you to say that Finnish men use violence on their women? We don't do that. And I'm like, yeah, well, talk to the people who did the study <laughs> or the men who are hitting on their spouses because we have a really big problem when it comes to gender, uh, gendered violence in Finland. And it's not just spousal violence. It's also violence that goes from, uh, it's generational. So you have grown sons using violence on their mothers, which is really horrible. And it's not very publicly discussed or debated on, but it happens. So we need to create spaces that make women feel safe at their homes, but also in the society. And as long as all these different realities and narratives are not made equally public, then we're not able to address them and tackle them. Now, I don't know if I answered your question. I think I took it to a whole new plane level, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll stop here for now. Uh, Uh, please don't stop because I wanted to uh, just, uh, can you tell, tell a little bit about uh, this initiative with the feminist party, uh, what it is? Okay, so um, first of all I have to clarify that I'm not here as a representative for the feminist party because I'm not on the board nor am I uh, currently like an active member of the party. And it's not a party yet because according to the Finnish law uh, you have to have 5,000 people agree that yes we need a new party and when they sign these little cards, we call them kannattaja korti. Uh, but you can only sign them if you are a Finnish citizen or like you're uh, eligible to vote in Finnish elections, so I'm not campaigning here. Uh, <laughs> I'm assuming most of you are not. But anyway, uh, so we're still, uh, the party is still missing 1,500 signatures, which means that it's, I don't know, we hope that you know, the signatures would be completed so that the party can be registered as a political party because that would enable them to set up candidates for the upcoming municipal elections, which are uh, early in the year, 2016. But at the moment, we have at least 3,500 signatures. You can check it from feminist in poor or fee. Yeah. But like the need for the party came from the fact that, well, first of all, we always look to our uh, sisters in Sweden, our siblings in Sweden. And if Estonia looks to Finland as a multicultural dreamland, we look to Sweden and say like, oh, they're doing everything so much better and they're always so happy and like, you know, things seem to be so much more smoother in Sweden. So of course, a lot of the inspiration comes from uh, following the in feminist initiative in Sweden and what Gudrun Schumann and uh, Sarai Post and all the other people who are active in the party have been able to accomplish and what kind of debates have been going on in Sweden because of the feminist initiative. I don't mean that they have changed entirely the political uh, culture, but they have brought in enough uh, ideas on the table, enough things to debate on, that kind of turns the conversation from the kind of the old, more masculine topics to also feminist topics and kind of like mainstreaming feminism as something that actually needs to be on the agenda and that. And it was really hilarious to notice during the election campaigns that uh, there were political parties who were, like all the political parties were trying to somehow get involved in feminism and say like, you know, oh, we have feminism like this. And one that I remember was uh, feminism and uten socialism or something like, you know, we have feminism without socialism and so on. So kind of like branding feminism in different ways, which is really interesting. It means that it, it interests people and it means that the feminist initiative had an impact, but they did the work for like over 10 years. So. Uh, We'll see how it goes for the Finnish Feminist Party, but uh, it might take about the same time to have similar positions as Feminist Initiative now has in Sweden. Time will tell. Or maybe Finland is now more ready for a feminist party uh, than Sweden were 10 years ago, so things might go faster. I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. That will be interesting to follow. So, Helen, uh, I will go back to the original question. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you give some examples about laws that 
have been uh, have aimed at protecting women, but have in fact ended up restricting. Mm -hmm. I'm also not a lawyer <laughs> by education. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I am uh, every day uh, involved in research, and also I teach in the university, and uh, and I train people in various fields: teachers, uh, educators, uh, government officials, and so on. So. Um, my, my view will be different from Hannah's, I think, but uh, I like that you brought up the issue of parental leave uh, and the example of fathers and fatherhood, uh, like this um, uh, share, the paternity leave. Uh, this is something that we are trying to do here in Estonia as well, uh, which we think would be beneficial to, to the country, to the uh, women and also for the men. So this is a good example of a law that is kind of restrictive for women in some sense, but also uh, it has a good cause, so, so something that we should do. But you also brought up the idea of uh, some norms that have been there for a reason, maybe a long time ago, but, uh, but they haven't changed and now they don't have this purpose anymore. For example, uh, coming from this parental leave uh, issue again, because this is something I have researched quite a lot and analyzed the law, uh, in my work. So we, for example, in Estonia have this, um, I think it's called maternity leave in English. Um, yes. Maternity leave, yeah. Yes. Hmm. <laughs> in Estonia it's like uh, the vacation for pregnancy and uh, giving birth or labor. So yeah, maternity uh, leave. It is 70 days. Uh, a woman has to take 70 days, at least 30 of which have to be prior to the giving labor date and the rest is after that. Uh, the European law only requires, I think, two weeks a minimum. So this is actually quite a long time. Maybe at some point in time it had this purpose that the uh, mother's health and the baby's health was, uh, f was the idea why it should be so long. But uh, today when the medicine has, uh, in, has uh, improved and also people don't work in the places where they have to, I don't know, have those harmful conditions, it maybe shouldn't be that strict. If you, if you refuse to take this uh, leave uh, 30 days before the labor date, then you just lose some money. So it's, I think it is something that has, for example, become kind, kind of restrictive for women and should be maybe changed in Estonia. But that's just one example. I have to give another one. <laughs> From Estonia until uh, I think 2009, uh, we had more than 200 professions that were forbidden for women. And uh, I mean, it was, I guess, uh, originally it was health protection. Uh, but when you looked at the list of these forbidden professions, they seemed quite random. It was like uh, you were not allowed to work as a um, matrus, uh, sailor. Sa sailor on a ship. Uh, you were not allowed to. Um, Mis on karus looma te uimastaja. Put uh, furry animals uh, on sleep. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know the exact term, but uh, and and actually, uh, I mean, uh, there was public discussion about this uh, list that it was a bit outdated, and there were actually women uh, trying to enter these professions, like the sailor on, on uh, ships. Um, who just ignored, I guess, these uh, uh, restrictions. But uh, in the end, it was um, abolished just because we adopted a totally new labor uh, law. So this uh, uh, other act, uh, you know, became uh, uh, invalid. But uh, anyway, uh, maybe at some point of time, I guess it was... Uh, uh, necessary to protect women from certain very harmful uh, work or to help them in negotiating terms for themselves, but that's later in time they just seem very random and uh, actually maybe women can take those decisions independently if they want to work with these furry animals or, or not. <laughs> um, well, um, so actually, this was my uh, question. Like, is it a, like a development curve? Can we leave certain things behind after a while? Or um, I don't know, Hannah. Do you have like, uh, since you are the lawyer here, <laughs> <laughs> can you help what us do you out? Think of this yeah, loss? law is very. <laughs> um, 
I don't know. Uh, it's a hard. <laughs> yeah, it's a hard tell. question. But uh, I think uh, at least in Norway, we did a lot of uh, cleaning up in the legal uh, system and uh, regulations in the 70s, uh, late 70s, uh, where the women's movement were quite strong in Norway, mm. and a lot of the laws and regulations, for instance, like prohibiting women in certain way ways which are really directly discriminatory, they, they went away at that time. Uh, but I think there's also a lot of uh, gender neutrals, uh, neutral laws that actually do not give women the same um, possibilities as men. Uh, for instance, when it comes to uh, uh, the police, uh, you have certain demands uh, for uh, strength and uh, you have to do a certain number of push-ups and things like that. And um, uh, I don't remember when it was, but it was criticized because almost no women passed the physical test. Uh, and um, is it a really good excuse to have such uh, restrictions or uh, such a um, level of strength, uh, demanding such a level of strength in the police? Can, can you maybe, can you, can't women maybe do other kind of things or is it very, uh, really necessary? Like, I don't know if uh, police today are the same as it was before or, you know. So uh, I think uh, the focus in Norway, at least, is more on the practical consequences of laws, uh, because uh, like directly discriminatory laws, it, it won't pass or, uh, yeah, it might exist, but then it, we're not aware of it, then we would, <laughs> yeah. It has, at least it has to be a very good excuse to, to be upheld, yeah. Uh, Helen, do you want to comment on this, please, <laughs> <laughs> or, or do you want me to do it? Because you, you can, have yeah, we had this discussion too, but I think uh, you can do it. <laughs> okay. Um, well, in Estonia, I think it's not in the law, but it's in the like admission rules to the police academy, and uh, it was changed uh, some years ago, maybe I don't know, five, six years ago, or even more. Uh, because previously uh, there were different norms for women and men and then they changed it to be the same for women and men uh, with the outspoken explanation of too many women entering police academy. Uh, that was the words of the director of the police academy, if I remember correctly. I hope I'm not blaming the wrong person. And, um, and of course the women applicants have dropped after that. Uh, so, um, it was, yeah, because Estonia is, has been one of the countries where I think the, the women share in the police force has been really high, I mean, almost up to 50%, I think. So, um, this was like a countermeasure. That was a very sad evolution, I, yes. <laughs> I think. Yes, uh, I think so too. Yeah. Uh, because, As, um, yeah. I think even some people even used the argument that now this is more gender equal because you don't have different levels of... Uh, demands for admission, so yeah, it's an upside-down argument. Yeah. <laughs> it is because you, you have to acknowledge that there are differences, especially in biological uh, strength measures and things like that, so yeah. Yeah, but it's also important to analyze, like you said, whether those demands are really necessary, whether the police force today has to be as physically strong as it, I don't, I don't know, had to be maybe 100 years ago. Or and apparently that was not necessary for you before, so... No. Or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, you may, but I just explained that this is only for the academy, so it's mm -hmm. not for the police um, profession. So actually those uh, norms are different for men and women, so it, it's only like a barrier for entering the educational system. Yeah, but it's really strange. Yeah, I guess it's a restriction also in the way that they won't necessarily become a police if they don't go to the academy or Sorry, the, the can, you no, can, you, can you become a police without going can you become a police without sure. going to the academy? I'm not sure. Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I mean, in Finland we have, like, I'm just going to say really quick, in Finland, like, the law is very clear about the equality, so they cannot discriminate against anyone, uh, except if you wear uh, a Muslim scarf, because according to our police chief, that is something that will make you uh, become non-natural. So, like, if I would be now a police officer, uh, I would just not be able to control my urges to treat everyone unfairly unless they agreed with me on everything. That seems to be his position, which is like super racist, but for them it's not racist, it's like just stating the obvious. So we have all these um, little things, 
microaggressions and all these uh, notions of what is normal and what is not, who is capable of uh, being neutral and objective and who is not. And that's where it gets really tricky because if you have laws in place, but then you have the ideas in people's heads, you cannot really tackle, uh, like you have the legislation in place, it's there, but it's not being applied because you have perceptions that are very like uh, harmful. And then one thing I discovered just a while ago is that uh, in the, for example, in the kitchen design, the kitchen is designed for a uh, mid-height woman. So we have this little, like, you know, everything includes design. Whatever, like, you see around you, there's a certain design that goes in. So if you go to the kitchen, it's like, you know, it's designed for someone who's about our height, <laughs> basically, and female. And that's how things are, like, put into places. So if you're a man and you're a bit taller, or you're a female and taller, and you go into the kitchen, you kind of feel out of place. And this is the little things that inform us, like, you know, where do I belong, where do I not belong? And the police is a bit of that. Like, they have a lot of masculinity and, like, this notion that, you know, in Finland, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the motorcycle police had this admission test where you had to lift the motorcycle in order to be accepted to the academy. And it's like, why would I have to, like, if I fall off my motorcycle, I'll probably be in the ambulance, you know? Like, I'm not going to stay back and try and lift it myself, so I don't know. May I just jump in because it, I think it was this about the police is actually a very good example. And actually, Marianne took, took up the scarf issue. Mm -hmm. I actually think it was the previous chief. I, I believe in the new. Yeah, he's retired one. now. Yeah, because I because but I discussed like with, with the president with the current one, the and title? he wasn't so he was softer. <laughs> but I, but I think um, I, I think one interesting issue that it's it, the scarf is obvious. But if you look at least in the in Finland, the, the dress code for a police is a police man's dress code. They, ha they haven't actually, even if they say that they would like to encourage more women to become police, they say that they want to have more eth ethnic diversity, but they are actually not changing anyway. So, uh, so there are sort of the, these double standards. So the law is probably, and I think the physical thing is easier to understand that there are requirements. But, uh, but, but then, you know, the you know, you, you very soon discover that you have to wear this thing around your neck, you know, this, what is it, the tie, mm -hmm. yes, exactly, and, and uh, these are other things. And, and of these course, jumpsuits, have you seen exactly. the Finnish police uniform? Sorry, but it's not very pretty. What to do about those things? <laughs> I think there's even a research about those uniforms that, uh, it's not Estonian, it's somewhere else, but uh, how those uniforms are actually designed after males as the kitchens. Mm. So if you're a woman, a female police officer, it's really uncomfortable for you to, to be in this uniform. Yeah, it doesn't fit. But it's also the same with like, you know, every time you go to talk, like I think female politicians have experience in this and they give you the headset. It's always designed thinking of a man with short hair. And if I go there, I'm like, so how are you going to put this on? <laughs> and they're like, you know, oh, maybe we give you the hand mic. Like, yeah, please. And it's like, that's something that fascinates me nowadays. Like the design behind everything. How are spaces designed? How are utensils designed? How are different like uh, things that we need, different space? How are they designed? Because behind each design, there's an ideology. And if the ideology is informed by patriarchy, then the design will also tell you to follow your gender. Then you will be in your comfort zone if you follow the assumed gender or like what is uh, socially acceptable. And if you don't, then, you know, there's little this hunk of, what is it, like, there'll be, it'll feel a bit rough and you're like, you know, you're struggling and you're fighting and you're like not really comfortable because you're not supposed to be comfortable. It's not designed for you. And that's not cool. But maybe we can continue on the issue of scars because in uh, Estonia we had this really weird debate uh, uh, in relation to the refugee issue, um, I think during, over the last year, it was 2015, I think one of our ministers proposed to um, ban the burqa and uh, the Refugee Council in Estonia managed to identify one lady in Estonia who covers um, her face. So it was actually like, of course the idea was, uh, you know, it should be a law for the future. Uh, but um, um, Reading uh, um, uh, women who uh, who wear niqab, uh, niqab or they cover their face, the, their point is that you know maybe we will just not leave the home if we are not allowed to dress like we like we want. So uh, there, I also see that it's a, a thing that is sort of supposed to protect women by somehow maybe liberating them, but in fact it becomes very restrictive. 
uh, because they can't move in public spaces anymore. Uh, what are they are... Can, but they might choose. They mm -hmm. can, but they might choose not to. I think well, it's really interesting yeah. how like politics always keeps going back to like female bodies and controlling them and like whether it's our reproduction rights or it's about like you know it can't be our uterus or the scarf we choose to wear but it's for political debate it's not something we decide it's something that we need to discuss this as a society and I can't imagine anything related to men that is as easily uh, accepted to the arena that okay let's discuss this like you know uh, who can the man have sex with or like should the man have sex at all if there is a chance that you know we will lose possible babies maybe we should have them keep their, their pants on for a while because you know according to whatever i don't know but it would sound crazy if i started talking about like men's reproduction rights or like health or whatever but then when it comes to women and especially what we wear where we wear it's out there it's like it's open season let's talk about it but in the end of the day it's a piece of cloth and everyone is welcome to wear what they want and not wear what they don't want and when it comes to politicians and in Finland we actually now have this uh, suggestion going to uh, to the parliament it's been suggested by our uh, this uh, party true Finns what a name uh, <laughs> do you have true Estonians here no, <laughs> no, choose a silly name like that. <laughs> yeah, wise people. Um, anyway, and I find it like extremely interesting the fact that they have the time, like looking at the situation we're in, like the Finnish politics today, the struggles, the challenges that we're facing, and these people have time to draft a paper and get signatures so they can have a say in what I can wear or not in the public space. And that is something that is of a national importance. Like, what the hell? No, it's not. Like, in the end of the day, what is it really? Who is it controlling? What are the numbers that are being affected? And what is the risk? If we have people dressing as they want, what are the actual risks that we're afraid of? And this is where we get to interesting, uh, interesting space. I use the word interesting a lot. It's not interesting. It's just super sad. I mean, we live in Europe. We live, like, you know, uh, we say we have democracy. We have certain values that we want to hang on to. Then we have Islam come in, and suddenly we're willing to move away from all these basic principles of freedom and democracy, and freedom of religion especially, as long as it means we can restrict Islam, we can restrict Muslims, and only Muslims, because you don't have these similar debates concerning any other faith, which then goes back, uh, it has a historical tradition, it, it is based on the whole idea of Europe, the idea of West, how it, was, how it came to be. And what was the other for the West? For the West to exist, there has to be the other. For us to be free and democratic and like, you know, liberal, there is the other who is not democratic, not free, not liberal. They're being oppressed, we are free. So then when we have Islam suddenly here in the West, there is a concern, ah, now they are here, so we have to restrict them. And suddenly we're not freedom for all, we're like freedom for those who agree with us and the hell with those guys. So I think it's a bigger issue than what women can wear or not. And it is an issue that has much deeper roots and it's something that we need to discuss. But I wish the discussion would go beyond what women wear or not. Hanna, how is it in Norway? Do you have the same debate? Uh, we actually have a debate now regarding uh, niqab and bur burqa. Uh, but it's, um, I think that m almost all the parties are agreed on that the general prohibition will never never be a reality because obviously it's not legal to have a general prohibition. Um, yeah. But I have to say, I think I read your prime minister just this morning saying something that she would never employ anybody with yeah. Uh, yeah. face cover. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's what, uh, because it's obviously linked to the covering of face. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think it will be general in the way it won't be like uh, in the society. It would, it would have, uh, if they make a prohibition, it would be linked to specific things. For instance, like at work, um, that you need some kind of, it depends maybe on the work, but that you need some kind of communication. You had cases about uh, nurse, uh, nursing, uh, people nursing um, older people and stuff, and that they wanted to work, but also cover their face. And that has been like looked upon as problematic because uh, one part of the work is to kind of um, have this connection with the person and that might be difficult when you don't see the person's face and things like that. 
But um, the main uh, discussion in Norway at the time being is um, in schools uh, and then in elementary schools. If, uh, and I think that uh, in some schools they have at least the school regulations um, prohibiting um, girls uh, wearing um, things that cover their face. So, yeah. Uh, do we have anybody from the audience wanting to comment or ask questions? There one over there. Thank you. Is it working? Okay, uh, I'm Ellen Abel from the Norwegian Embassy. Uh, not uh, on the burqa issue, but on uh, what Helen said on, um, on the paternity and maternity leave in Estonia. If I understood you correctly, you said that the main problem or restriction is that um, the current system obliges the mother to be home for 70 days. And I was wondering, do you have any statistics uh, or numbers showing what would happen or, you know, after those 70 days, as far as I understand, there's almost one and a half years of, of fully paid leave. How many mothers go back to work after those 70 days? And is perhaps, well, are there any problems with, with, the, uh, with the, the, the part of the father, whether that's, uh, whether you have a specific time for the father and whether that should be longer? Because um, also, as far as I understand, there is a very, f uh, although it is possible to share uh, these one and a half years between the father and the mother quite freely, apparently uh, outside of those 70 days. Uh, I understand that most fathers don't take leave and, and are there any legal measures that could or should be done in order to increase that share? Thank you. Uh, yes, currently we have this uh, father's leave or paternity leave which is uh, voluntary and it's up to two weeks I think right now. Uh, it is paid, uh, it used to be not to be paid for some time when there was uh, recession. Um, but after those 70 days, yes, we have uh, this one and a half year, approximately, of uh, very well-paid parental leave, which could be shared theoretically, but uh, actually it is only, I think, 7 to 9 percent of men who actually take this uh, parental leave. So mostly women stay at home. So um, uh, in praxis, we did an analysis on this uh, system of parental leave and uh, parental benefit a couple of years ago and now I think it's going to be soon in the government for discussion the, the changes that uh, should be made to this uh, regulation we have right now and one of the changes which will be probably proposed is uh, giving uh, men a longer paternity leave. Uh, what we suggested was this uh, model that is in Norway that you have this uh, father's share which couldn't be transferred to, to mothers, but I'm not sure if it, this is going to actually happen, so we'll see. But also it, they have different measures, like uh, currently in Estonia, if you take this parental leave and you want to get the benefit, the full benefit, then you cannot uh, work very much. You can do some work and get some salary, but otherwise if you get uh, more than, I think it was the minimum salary, if you get more then you will lose some of the benefit as well. So people don't want to go to, to, to work more and lose benefit, but people want to work actually while they are at home too. So one of the changes will probably be that uh, it will be more free to combine work and being at home with the child. So you maybe can like work 50% of the time and get 50% of the benefit. Uh, yeah, and there are some measures about sharing the parental leave with, uh, for the mothers and fathers, so they could like, take half of the parental leave and benefit on the same time, so they both can combine staying at home and so on. So it, is ha it has been recognized that the issue of uh, men not staying at home with kids is a problem uh, that should be addressed. And uh, the reason it is a problem is both we, we need more women in the workforce because we are a small society and older society. Uh, and on the same time, we also know, need the children to be born. So uh, otherwise, we <laughs> don't have anyone in the future to, to, 
uh, pay us pensions. So, yeah, <laughs> we, we kind, uh, kind of have to take the women to the labor market and uh, on the same time they have to give birth to the kids as well. So it means that fathers have to be involved more than they are right now. We have uh, one comment over there. Yes, thank you. I'm Kirsti Narinen, the Finnish ambassador and a lawyer, which is now helping a bit to comment because I mean, I, I've been thinking about this very much because I very much thank Mariam for this uh, kind of these opinions about the normative society because the normative society, which is our like rule of law is basically built on normative society. So for that part, we have to be very proud of that. On the other hand, I think we are overdoing it because I mean, when you try to build values and a value-based society, norms tend to become more restrictive than, than guiding in particular when they are tried to be built in a very, very uh, detailed manner as they are today. And I think every lawyer knows that actually no, there is no law that can be detailed enough to regulate the, the society or the, or the life in general, particularly in the world which is moving in such a fast phase and speed as the society today is, is, is functioning. So at the, how can we, I, I think that this is actually the core issue is that how do we combine attitude building and which is actually the only sustainable manner to build society. How do we combine that with restrictive or supportive normatives? Because for instance, the, the, the female quota or the gender quota or, or in both ways, I mean, it actually functions both ways, of course, but it's in business and in, in government, higher officials, it tends tended to be supporting or, or, or um, kind of, you know, being supportive for women, but now it's not always the case. In particular now when the females are actually in government service a bit, a bit more than more than men so that works both ways so how do we for instance combine that with the attitude building that one day we would do not need that that it's kind of automatic that all aspects of society are taken into consideration in decision making but also in preparing those norms which then regulate the decision making and i think that this was very a very good point of view of this uh, this design thing that it's also something that we most likely do not very often think about i mean if you compare frederick and myself i belong to the average and he doesn't mm -hmm. so this is how kitchens look like i agree mm -hmm. but also i mean we do need to have children we need to be able to combine work with children and there in the modern society and mod modern work life there's a lot of things and ways which with, with which you could think about. And I was actually thinking of the 70 days that that roots might be in the old, wasn't it so that in the Catholic world, you know, like 500 years ago, 40 days after birth, you should not go to church because you need to be clear somehow there was this c cleaning process so that that's where the 70 days actually probably comes from. So this is where the roots are. Can we imagine that? Thank you. Yeah, actually I've heard that 40 days in many different societies, that it's still very active and it has to do with the post, uh, post birth, like postnatal bleeding. So that's when you become pure. And it has its foundation in religion, in Judaism, in Islam, in uh, Christianity, which is very interesting. So when we know these things, we become better informed. We know why certain things are happening. And now one great example is that uh, I'm looking at Eo for translation. <laughs> Finnish is not even her mother tongue. <laughs> uh, but like we have the education, yeah, education authorities in Finland uh, suggested yesterday that we should have this new policy in schools where we call the pupils in elementary school by their first names. And people got enraged because the media uh, made these titles where they said that the education administration wants to remove gender from the school. And the idea was that instead of talking about girls and boys, just call them by their names. And this is something that's now the debate still going on in social media in Finland, but it's unbelievable the kind of resistance you face when you try to change a little thing, because that already is something that would inform the children from a very young age, that they're more than the, just the gender, that they don't have to uh, already start thinking of the social gender when they're in school, but that they can just be, you know, <laughs> people. Uh, but yeah, I think 
we have to kind of like, um, the more knowledge we have of why we do certain things, and this goes like in activism, this is one of the core values, like one of the core uh, ideas that kind of move activism. It's that acknowledge what is the current situation, what is your position, what informs you, why do you do certain things, where does the history come from, and if you don't have the knowledge of the history that brings you here, in, and why you do certain things, like for example, um, my background informs me a lot. The fact that I am a black uh, woman living in Finland and also a Muslim, uh, change it, like it doesn't change, but like it has a huge impact on my experience in the public space in Finland. And I can go around and say like, this is Finland, this is how everyone is treated. Or I can be a bit more analytical and say, okay, so uh, I'm working with my friend Binya and her experience in Helsinki city is very different than mine. Where does that come from? Where does it have its roots? And just to make these different things visible, that's the first, like we have to see what, what is happening so that we can change it. And at the moment, I think a lot of the things are happening, they're not seen, they're neutral, they're tasteless, they're orderless, so we don't see them. And so we're not able to catch them and like, you know, change them. So yeah, that would be my five cents. What about the lawyer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if uh, it's a question directed to me really. <laughs> Uh, no, but um, I don't really want to comment on that. I, I think you answered it very good. But uh, I um, uh, I kind of wanted to say something uh, in regards with the burkini ban and uh, mm -hmm. what are women supposed to wear uh, and things like that. <laughs> um, and um, uh, yeah, even though uh, like a prohibition in no way wouldn't be like the way to go. Um, it's, um, I read this uh, article uh, and uh, it's kind of from a legal perspective. The burkini ban is in a way saying that uh, uh, the women are doing something wrong in a way. You kind of put uh, a criminal n uh, note to the, to the fact that you cover your head or you cover your body. And um, that it was a um, criminal professor in Norway writing an article about uh, just the fact that you put the blame on the women and that you actually make it a legal question in giving maybe penalties because you wear these kind of things, that it's really an absurd, uh, absurd thing because um, even though, um, uh, I don't know how to formulate this, but uh, the people that want uh, women not to, to wear headscarves because they mean it, uh, that it is uh, restricting the women and uh, that is anti-women uh, uh, freedom and everything like that. Uh, it's, the blame is not on the women anyways. It's, uh, then it's uh, the religion or it's other cultural aspects or things like that. But when you criminalize, um, criminalize for instance, uh, the burqa and the dress, you kind of put the blame on the women. and. That that's really, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I also wanted to comment on what Marian said about the uh, yesterday's news in Finland. Uh, it also made Estonian news that Finnish schools are change, changing things, and I also have to give comments in the media today and tomorrow and so on. <laughs> so it's a really big news, and and of course uh, it was. Um, put forward as an absurd thing to do and, it, and the point of it was lost, I think. It, it, uh, it just was something like uh, Finnish schools want to ban girls and boys, mainly. So, yeah, now I have a lot of explaining to do, but it's a good <laughs> thing, I think. It's something we have been working on too. Um, but I also wanted to comment that uh, it is important to, to analyze where certain norms come from and why they are there. Uh, we have, for example, trained uh, ministry officials uh, about gender mainstreaming and, uh, and uh, gender mainstreaming in this process of policy develop development and so on. And uh, usually we just do things and we don't think about those. We just do them the way we have always done. There are some norms that, so, which are in place and we just continue them. We don't think about it. We don't analyze the reasons or whether those are okay or maybe they should change or how they, for example, different policies affect women and men or in Estonia, Estonians and Russian speaking uh, people and so on. So it is important to analyze, to, to be aware of uh, why we do certain th things and how they impact others. So yes. We have a question from the audience. Well, actually more of a comment. It's about the burqa and niqab. 
uh, my experience on this point is, is this tries to ban those mm -hmm. pieces of items is based on misconceptions. A, on the misconceptions that the women are forced to wear it by their spouses, by their religion, and they cannot resist and wear different clothes. That's the one misconception behind these bans. They're trying to liberate women who maybe to a big part wish to wear it by themselves, maybe all wish to wear them by themselves, maybe there's only one who has been forced to wear it. That's the one misconception. The second misconception comes from the fear of terrorism. And that's particularly about the burqa and when the face is covered. Oh, we don't even know that is a woman behind this. This could be a terrorist and the burqa covers the bomb they're carrying. Again, there may have been incidents, but these are those two major misconceptions which driving radicals in a lot of European countries into this discussion, which should not be happening. And I fully agree on that one. Yeah, I think the misconceptions is true. Uh, and it's really interesting because if you look back 50, 60 years, uh, I think there have been a lot of comments made in the public space about how women shouldn't do too much thinking, even here in the uh, European countries. And men would speak on behalf of women because women needed men to look out for them and to protect them and so on. And now that we have more and more racialized women in European countries, then the notion goes to them. So now we have also women who, who are concerned about, like, you know, women who look like me <laughs> and who want to kind of like protect me and save me from myself <laughs> or my religion and so on. And it's absurd. But then one thing is that uh, me being pro hijab, like, uh, I wear this voluntarily and I want to wear it, but that does not mean that I support forcing anyone on wearing it. And those are two separate conversations that need to be had because I know that there are societies where women do not have the option of dressing as they choose to dress. And what is fundamental if you're a feminist, if you're really ideologically feminist, is that you need to be able to support women in whatever their choices are. That, you know, my body, my choice. Whether it's reproduction rights or it's what you wear or what bag you carry or whatever. So these two need to go kind of like together because often uh, feminists get kind of punished or like uh, if a story comes out where a woman s says that she has been forced to wear it, then you have 10 racists sending you a message like, ah, oh, this is what you guys are supporting. So this is the kind of like attitudes you're supporting. And you're like, no, I really don't like, you know, like if there's a rally to uh, rally against the Iranian government's ban, uh, forcing women to dress a certain way, I will go there. Not because I think everyone should wear it or that everyone shouldn't wear it, but because I think any battle where women are fighting for their basic rights, then those of us who identify as feminists, we need to be allies. We need to support those women. So when in Canada they had the slot march <laughs> in solidarity, you have to support that because you also cannot have people saying that if you dress a certain way, if your skirt is short, then uh, you're kind of asking it for yourself. And another aspect that relates to how women dress is how like, we're kind of fed this idea that uh, we, men need to be protected from women in some way, that if women dress a certain way or if women go to certain spaces, then you know, men cannot think clearly. And this is an ancient idea that we could already bury because how little are we thinking of the men if we're always saying that, you know, oh, yes, well, men are like this. So we should more concentrate on telling women how to protect themselves. That is belittling the men. So we, we cannot go there either. So we have to kind of like address these issues. But one, well, I know we're running out of time. One thing that I find intriguing is that I've been following a little bit the elections in the U.S. And uh, of course, as any <laughs> reasonable president, I wish Hillary Clinton becomes an ex-president, not because I support Hillary's politics fully, but because I think Trump is just horrible. But what I find very interesting is this one comment I read on social media that was saying that uh, when the Republicans started backing away from Donald Trump, that he has done horrible, horrible things. And he said so many horrible things. But what broke the horse's uh, back, the camel's back, was when he broke one of the Ten Commandments, thou shall not covet another man's woman. That's from the Ten Commandments. That's Moses' law. Donald Trump broke that by admitting on tape that he'd wanted to have sexual relations with a married woman. And that was the point where the Republicans are backing up. And I was like, when I read that, I was like, oh my God, like, could it be that we might get the first female president in the US, not because the US has become suddenly feminist, but because patriarchy is so strong that it's not willing to forgive Donald Trump for coveting another man's woman. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ridiculous.
That's a very interesting analysis. I never thought about that. I'm, I'm uh, very sorry that we had to wrap up this um, debate, uh, but um, I hope we can continue the conversation in the <laughs> <laughs> lobby later. But um, again, to uh, finish uh, like on a positive uh, note, I will ask all of you to um, give us some uh, advice what you think we can do in order to, I don't know, <laughs> protect women without like uh, suppressing them or just the general life advice, whatever. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I can start. Uh, well, everybody should join a, a women's rights group. No. <laughs> uh, I actually think, think that's a very good way to, to do it because even though you might not uh, be uh, uh, or... Uh, um, feel the way or the same way or look upon it, all the same things. I think it's very important to just address address the is issue uh, and to create uh, debates like uh, you do here today and just put uh, these kind of questions on the agenda and um, uh, and even uh, even just uh, horrible uh, hate speech and everything. I, I would like it to to go up uh, out in the open to. Uh, to actually be able to to answer it um, in a in a way that maybe will change some people's minds, and I think it's very important. So, yeah. Do you have some words of encouragement? Do you want to go first? <laughs> I have to think. Why have I said it? So, life advice. So, maybe for me, the education and gender issue is really uh, something I I like and something I think is important. So, I think maybe. For a better society, for, for a society where there are less restrictive laws for women and uh, restrictive norms in general, uh, for either gender, we should actually start from the very beginning because, for example, in Estonia, we clearly divide boys and girls and uh, they, they have the different paths in their life. So we should do something like Finland did yesterday, in, in yesterday's news, that we shouldn't so much divide people on the basis of gender, but offer equal opportunities and equal possibilities for both of them. So if the new generation has brought up in a better way, so maybe the society also changes. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do anything about the current situation right now. This also has to happen, but let's start from the beginning as well. Excellent points. Then I can finish off by saying that uh, everyone has a voice. Uh, Arundhati Roy, who's now releasing her next book after a few years break, uh, once said really eloquently that there are no such thing as uh, voiceless people. There are people who have been intentionally silenced. And this is something we need to remember as allies. So uh, it, you should all be feminists, first of all. <laughs> everyone should be. Uh, or at least be an ally, which means at the very minimum, if you cannot participate in making the world better, don't participate in making it worse. Uh, if you want to, <laughs> if you want to uh, talk for a group, make sure that they are there. Like allow, make the space. That's like you can. Cre if we now wanted to address, for example, we didn't talk about disabled women, for example, which is a group that faces a lot of challenges in, uh, I think, all of the countries. But for us to address that, there would have to be someone here from that specific group to say what are the needs that they have. And as allies, we need to kind of like uh, try to take those me that message forward. I think that's all for me. But thank you. You've been a great audience. And, and I thank you all very for the conversation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your life advice. <laughs> yes, go and make the world feminist. Um, I will 